translated from the French by Don Pabst. To the memory of C.D. who fell into death like Narcissus into his own image. I am used to doing it's 
such a case, she suddenly emitted a desperate sigh, pained, prolonged, the S in Sèvres whistled between her teeth as if she had already suffered some sort of intolerable sorrow over her next abandonment. An immense pity squeezed at my heart. I hadn't done justice to the humble, harsh charm of this child. I threw myself on her, covered her with kisses, repentant as an unfaithful lover. I went to look for a brush in the bathroom and began styling her hair, which had become flat and broken. I rubbed her body with oils, perfumes, and I don't know how many times I loved that child until day lightened the window behind the closed curtains. October 15th. The road for Sèvres is the road for all flesh, and the size of the vomiting girl won't do anything about it, alas. November 2nd. Festival of the Dead. Lucky day. Montparnasse Cemetery was admirably grey this morning. The immense crowd of mourners squeezed into its walkways among the glorious chrysanthemums, and the air had the bitter, intoxicating taste of love. Eros and Thanatos. All these sexes under the earth. Does anyone ever think of them? The night falls quickly. Even though it's the festival of the dead, I won't go out tonight. I remember, I just turned eight, one night in November, similar to this one today, I was left alone in my room, which was invaded by shadow. I was worried that the house was full of strange comings and goings, full of mysterious whispers that, I felt, had something to do with my mother's illness. Above all, I felt she had forgotten me. I don't know why I didn't dare to turn on the lights, lying silent and afraid in the dark. I was getting bored. To distract and console myself, I tried unbuttoning my little trousers. There I found that sweet, hot little thing that always kept me company. I no longer know how my hand discovered the necessary movements, but I was suddenly captured in a vortex of pleasures from which it seemed. Nothing in the world could ever free me. I surprised myself beyond the limits of imagination to discover such a resource for pleasure in my very own flesh, and to feel my proportions modify themselves in a way that I didn't even suspect just moments before. I sped up my movements and my pleasure grew, but at the very moment that a wave, born in the depths of my entrails, seemed to want to submerge me and lift me above myself, quick steps resounded in the corridor, the door opened abruptly, the light flashed in. Pale, haggard, my grandmother hid herself at the threshold, and her trouble was so great that she didn't even notice the state I was in. My poor child, your mother is dead. Then, grabbing me by the hand, she forcefully dragged me with her. I was wearing a sailor suit, and thankfully the coat was long enough to mask the fly that I hadn't had the time to close. My mother's room was full of people, but sunken in half-darkness. I noticed my father on his knees at the bedside, and he was crying his head stuck into the sheets. At first, I had trouble recognizing my mother in this woman, who seemed infinitely more beautiful, grand, young, and majestic than she had ever seemed until then. Grandmother was sobbing. Kiss your mother again once more, she said, pushing me towards the bed. I brought myself up to this marvelous woman stretched out among the whiteness of the linen. I placed my lips on her waxen face. I squeezed her shoulders in my little arms. I breathed in her intoxicating odor. It was that of the bombix, that the natural 
history professor had passed out at school and that I had brought up in a cardboard box. That fine, dry, musky odor of leaves, larvae, and stones was leaving Mother's lips. It was already seeping out into her hair like a perfume. And suddenly, the interrupted pleasure took over my childish flesh with a disconcerting abruptness. Pressed against Mother's shoulder, I felt a delicious commotion rush over me while I poured my heart out for the first time. Poor child, said Grandmother, who had understood nothing about my size. November 5th. People always say that those who love the dead are stricken with anosmia. There's nothing to that, and my nose perceives the most diverse odors vividly, even if, like everyone, I am accustomed to those of my surroundings to the point of no longer being able to smell them. It could, in fact, be possible that the odor of bombix impregnates my whole apartment without my even noticing. The ladies show no signs of having any special trouble cleaning the antique store. At the very most, once in a while, there's a vague grumbling over the old objects, the nests of dust, the fragile things that are so ugly even though new ones could be purchased for much less. It's only in my private apartment on the fifth floor that their behavior causes me to reflect. They stare into the corners with a look of prudent suspicion. They observe me slyly and, most of all, they sniff the apartment's odor, shifting their eyes. They sniff and sniff, searching their memory, finding nothing that's right. Sniff again, until a strange worry spreads over them. Then they become hunted beasts and escape. When I try to get them back to work, they give me the most vague answers with a frightened look, shaking their heads if I offer to increase their wages. I put a new ad into the papers and the same story begins again. One day, however, one of the cleaning ladies had the courage to ask me why I always wore black clothes, even though I wasn't in mourning. Another very young, already fat, and whose name I've forgotten, declared in the local store that I smelled like a vampire. Always this old and aberrant between two beings so fundamentally opposed as the vampire and the necrophiliac, between the dead that feed off the living and the living who love the dead. I don't deny, nevertheless, that after several days the perfume of the bombix transforms itself into an odor like that of heated metal that, more and more acrid, thickens finally into a stench of entrails. Each of these stages has its charm, even if the last announces separation. But never would I have the idea to eat the flesh of one of my friends, the dead, nor to drink the blood. As for the concierge, for a long while now, she has stopped being surprised that I don't have a girlfriend, and since the slightest boyfriend has never appeared either. She simply concluded that I am a sort of Joseph, a real loner. All the better. There are certain truths that rudimentary souls would have trouble accepting. My boyfriends with anuses glacial as mint, my exquisite mistresses with grey marble bellies. I bring them at night into my old Chevrolet while everyone sleeps, and I take them at Sèvres, or the one at Anières. December 3rd. This morning, while I was taking care of my correspondence, a client made a request that troubled me. It was a man of around 40 years, with a ruddy complexion in the first stages of baldness, dressed like a lawyer or the director of a business. He looked over the furniture, the porcelain, the paintings, but most
closely the curios, seemingly looking for something, then finally approaching my table. Tell me, sir, don't you have any amusing Natsuki? It's specifically those of Koshi Miramato that I'm thinking of. For a second, our stares met. How many know Koshi Miramato, the master of the 18th century, who, in his Kyushu workshop, consecrated himself exclusively to macabre Natsuki, the dead sodomized by hyenas, fellating succubi, masturbating skeletons, cadavers interlaced like nests of vipers, fetus devouring phantoms, courtesans impaling themselves on the stiffness of a dead body. I'm sorry, I responded, but usually the people who own the works of this master hesitate to give them up. Nevertheless, if you would like to leave me your address, I can if I happen to find something. He refused with a curtness that made me suspect that he had understood I would never sell him anything of this sort. The Natsuki of Koshi Muramato, I save them for myself. Only a necrophiliac can collect these objects, and the man intrigued me. Would you prefer to stop in again? I suggested. I don't live in Paris. It's very rare that I come here. He nodded goodbye and left. I wouldn't have disliked discussing the macabre Natsuki with him. Offer him a few words, certainly vain, then smile at him knowingly. Not to offer him fuller knowledge, but to see if he would grasp that I understood. That's all. For if necrophiliacs, they are so rare, recognize each other, they don't look for each other. They have definitely chosen incommunicability, and their loves transcend into the inexpressible. Alone, we are not even the link between life and death. There is no link, for life and death are forever united, inseparable as water mixed with wine. I cannot prevent myself from laughing as, without missing a beat, I remove from my vest pocket a Natsuki that I carry with me constantly. It measures no more than three centimeters and represents two peasants fucking the sockets of a skull with great skill. December 4th. The visit from the Natsuki lover brought back to mind those few in which necrophilia revealed itself in others. Frankly, nothing very sensational or frequent. I remember, for example, a funeral I attended when I was about twenty. I found myself there that time not out of taste, but convenience. It was a distant relative whose disagreeable appearance and repulsive disposition removed any desire to visit his coffin. It was during the absolution priest was chanting. Some women were sobbing. In the private chapel, the air was scarce, and the catafalque took up almost all the central space. The perfume of flowers, candles, and incense revealed itself with a subtle hint of pompix. I soon noticed that I wasn't the only one to notice it. I found myself in one of the minuscule aisles, where the shadows were very thick, though not quite thick enough. To prevent me from making out an extremely banal couple dressed in mourning, whom I guessed, I don't know why, had come to enjoy themselves. No doubt the music, the funeral chants, and the bombics had the custom of acting on the man in a specific way, for I distinctly heard his companion whisper to him the precise question on the stage found himself in. She used a vulgar word, something from an army barracks, of a crudeness that took me aback. There was, I believe, another outline of a gesture, but I wasn't sure. Either he was too timid to advance any further, or he preferred the intimacy of his room. But the couple made haste to leave the chapel. The black clothes of the woman brushed against me as she passed. She had the milky, fixed stare of a blind woman. These two were only watered-down necrophiliacs, and their preferences couldn't rise to the height of passion. But there are others that hesitate at nothing, and I remember a bad encounter at Montmartre Cemetery only last year.
just been interred. A woman neither beautiful nor ugly, insignificant enough to seem to never be able to inspire extreme emotions. As soon as I knew she was dead, I wanted her terribly. I arrived at the cemetery in a torrential rain that certainly wasn't going to facilitate my task. I picked the lock on the gardener's tool shed, as I am accustomed to do, in order to procure a spade. I always operate with great speed, and it never takes me more than an hour to open the grave, descend into it, raise the coffin lid with a cold chisel, and, weighed down with the body, climb back to the surface using a carefully perfected technique. There remains nothing left to do but transport it to my car, the only consistent difficulty being the hoisting of the body over the wall with the help of a rope. That night, the horrible rain slowed down my movements. Engorged with water, the earth was heavy. Once more, the meteorologists had predicted that the precipitation would last fifteen days, and I couldn't wait that long. As I struggled to climb out of the slippery grave with my package, I saw a man who was hiding behind a tombstone to watch me. His dark silhouette, his thick neck detached themselves neatly from the depth of the night. An atrocious fear spread over me. This man was going to follow me, kill me maybe, or more likely, he was going to denounce me. Without knowing what I was doing, I abandoned the actress and fled as fast as my anguish permitted me. I cleared the wall in a single bound, and it wasn't until I had arrived at home that, little by little, I regained my composure. I was certain I hadn't been followed. The man had nothing against me. The next day, in reading the paper, I obtained an abominable surprise. In Montmartre Cemetery, the body of a well-known actress had been discovered, stripped of its clothes, disemboweled, and horribly mutilated. The rain had effaced all clues. So the revolting man who had spied on me had taken advantage of the fruit of my efforts. How horrible! I burst into tears of vexation and grief. December 22nd. I went this morning for a stroll around the ivory cemetery, charming under the snow like an ornate centerpiece made of sugar, strangely lost in a plebeian district. Watching a widow decorate the tomb of the deceased with a little Christmas tree, I noticed suddenly how rare they've become, those women in full mourning, in their floating veils, though often blonde, who haunted necropolises twenty years ago. It was, for the most part, usually, not always, professionals who practiced their art behind the family monuments with an absolutely depressing absence of 